Hello and welcome to this tutorial on how to create a bubble shooter game in Construct 3. Let me just show you uh, the uh, end result here. So you can see you can shoot the bubbles, you can aim them, you can shoot them and whenever there are three or more and they will explode. So whenever there are uh, bubbles that are loose they will also explode along with it. That's the entire idea, of course. You get score, you get a best score here, and whenever a bubble hits the water here at the bottom, the game is over. That's it. Uh, so let me show you how that is done. Um, this is the main layout, and it consists of several layers. So the app background just contains the background of the application and it's no purpose otherwise. Uh, the bubbles layer is where all the bubbles uh, are being spawned, this one here. Next, the markers are the purple blocks at the left hand side, these one is here. They reside in the markers layer. Uh, there are, they're there to keep track of where the bubbles should end up when they are falling down. In essence, every marker has a row ID as an instance variable. Check it out. Uh, the top four have row IDs three to uh, zero to three, like this one. Up, up. Uh, zero being the bottom row, of course, and four being the top row. Uh, bubbles uh, also have a row ID, so in essence the bubbles are always attached to the same row ID of the markers. If the markers, uh, markers that have the move to behavior and it's the markers that are dropped from the sky. And since all bubbles are with, with the row ID are linked to the markers, they drop accordingly. Um, the top marker with the blue color is a spawn point for markers. Um, there's a timer for that. When it fires, it will create a new marker at the spawn point with a row ID plus one. A new row of bubbles will be created for that row ID and they will start falling down. Uh, the marker also contains an offset. Here. Um, the markers also contain an offset, that's the number of pixels the bubbles need to be spawned at from the left hand side, so the bubbles are not directly under another. Yeah. At the left side and the right side of the layout there are two lines, two yellow lines, those are there because they have the solid behavior and the bubbles would bounce off them when they are fired. You can see here, uh, you have the solid behavior. The, the dialogue layer contains the objects of the game over dialog. That's the dialog shown and hidden by showing the and hiding the layer. Uh, this one here. Uh, and the HUD layer is there for all items on the HUD on the top of the layout here. Uh, finally, there's a data layer. At runtime, arrays get spawned and they need to be added to the layout. For that purpose, I always create a data layer. It's just a layer that's only there for that purpose, so they are nicely grouped all together. At the top right, you can find a dummy object that has a timer behavior. This is a timer object. Uh, when the game contains a general timer, I have the habit of creating an object timer, uh, especially for that uh, purpose. The controls at the bottom are there because they control the trajectory of the bubble when it's being fired. And I will show in code how that actually happens. Um, there are two layouts. We're looking at the game layout right now. Uh, and the objects layout. Um, here we have all of the object types that are spawned at runtime. First and foremost, of course, there are the bubbles, but they all have been added into the bubbles family because they share a common behavior. Uh, the family has gotten the blue behavior, uh, the bullet behavior, excuse me, where we make sure that the bounce of solids uh, check mark is set. Let me show you. So the bullet behavior with the bounce uh, of uh, solids checked. So the row ID instance variable is there to link a bubble to a marker so it can be fall be falling down every time uh, the timer fires. And the bubble type uh, instance variable just contains the bubble type to compare it to. And finally, the state contains the current state of a bubble. A bubble can have three states, ready for launch, which means that the bubble is in the launcher at the bottom of the screen and ready to be launched. When the user clicks, the state changes to launched 
and when it arrives at its place it becomes locked. Uh, there's also a particle effect with a very simple smoky uh, sprite actually. Uh, this particle effect has a rate set to 100 and it has a spray cone of 360 degrees. By making it a uh, type of one shot it will behave as an explosion. The particle, particles have a set color effect that attached to it. By setting the color at runtime according to the color of the bubble we don't need a particle bubble per color. Um, and lastly there is a collision overlay. Uh, this one here. It's the, an object with the same size as a, as a bubble, but it created and destroyed along with the bubble. It exists because uh, handling collisions between two objects of the same type and construct is a bit of a hassle due to the nature of the picking and the object reference in that occurs. So I'll come back to that in a minute when we look at the code. Uh, so let's see. We have an event sheet and the event sheet has been uh, split up in a number of sections. First is the initializations section. So the, first of all we need to make sure that the game over dialog is hidden so we can start the game. And next we use the advanced random plugin to create a probability table and divide the probability along the bubbles equally. So you can change that obviously if you want more green bubbles or more orange bubbles or something like that. And next we generate a new starting position uh, by generating four rows by the first four markers, 0 to 3. We initialize the top marker, so next we need to create a new line. We can increase the, uh, we can its, increase its marker number, so now the top marker is 3. Whenever we create a new uh, line, the top marker will be 4 and then 5 and stuff like that. So the top marker variable is there to identify which marker is currently the top marker. We will need it in the logic later. Um, and the next offset means that the next marker needs to be uh, spawned at 32 pixels of offset. Uh, the next offset is always switching between 0 offset and 32 offset, so they are nicely uh, next to each other row by row. So now we create a new bubble to be launched by initializing a new bubble with the ready for launch state. Uh, bubbles can have three different states. Ready for launch means the bubble is in the launcher. Uh, once it launched, it becomes launched, and it becomes uh, when it arrives at its position, it becomes locked. So we call a function called generate new bubble. Come back to that later at the x and y coordinate, um, and then we give it a state and row ID. Uh, and then we start the timer on the timer object. Uh, it contains the rate at which the bubbles are falling down. We have a constant uh, for that uh, called timer. We can change it if we want to. We use the local storage plugin to get the best score by checking if it exists. This will result in either an item missing or item uh, exists uh, being fired. So we get the best score and then we initialize the current score to zero, of course. Here we have the on item exists of the local storage. Uh, we get the best score and we use the asynchronous uh, functionality of construct3 to wait for the action to complete and then we set the best score. If it's missing, we just initialize uh, the score. That's it. So that's for the initialization part. I've grouped all the base functionality uh, into one block as well. So very simple, on every tick we just update the score and the best score. Um, and the timer object on the layout serves its only purpose to control the timer behavior. When the timer fires, the bubbles drop down and a new row of bubbles is created. So uh, first we create a new marker that's spawning a new marker at the top left using the marker spawning object. Yeah. We do that call it a function make new marker. Uh, the function is asynchronous, so we have to wait for the action to complete. And next we generate a new row of bubbles with the top marker as a row ID. We call generate row for that uh, with the top marker saved a variable. Um, then we pick all the markers and we move the markers to a, a new position that's actually the Y coordinate plus the bubble size. Bubble size is also a global number which uh, also sets uh, which has been set to the height and width of the uh, of the bubble actually. And lastly here uh, the game over conditions are very clear and uh, when it uh, whenever a locked bubble hits the water at the bottom uh, the game over is, uh, is the game the game is over and the game over dialogue has been shown.
This is the base functionality. Then for the controls at the bottom. So when the left button isn't down and the dialog isn't shown, the arrow can just move around. That's what happens here. And the zero angle of an object is pointing to the right. So we have to subtract 90 degrees from it because the angle function starts from the assumption that the angles go up. Uh, you set the angles to aim uh, and this uh, time without 90 degrees subtraction because uh, the bullet behavior expects that. When the left mouse button is clicked and the dialog isn't showing, a bubble can be launched. So that's what happens here. Um, there should only be bub one bubble led ready for launch at the same time. So the bullet behavior is just activated and the state is changed to launched. Yeah? It's enabled. Uh, and next we'll wait for a half a second for before a new bubble is created. Uh, the new bubble is created again with the ready for launch state. You can see that here. That's it. Then for the bubble. Um, in this uh, event we just pick all the markers and for each marker we set the Y coordinate of all the bubbles attached to that marker which are locked. That's it. So that way by doing that all of the time uh, we make sure that all bubbles stay attached to their respective marker. Uh, now we're checking if a bubble collides with another bubble. It's a bit uh, um, uh, a bit tricky in a construct tree. It's inherent to the way the picking is done and how objects are referenced actually. To circumvent this, an object type is created called a collision overlay. It's, a, it's as big as the bubble itself and, the, uh, and always overlaps with the bubble. It's created alongside with the bubble and also destroyed along with the bubble. Uh, whenever a bubble collides with a collision overlay and it's not its own collision overlay, uh, then the status will end, end where the status has equals launched. That means the bubble has collided with another locked bubble. Okay. So that's what we here do a collision with overlay, and it's not the same collision overlay as the bubbles we are checking. Um, and the stage has is launched, then we uh, do this behavior. So first we set the row ID. It's the same uh, as the row ID of the collision overlay uh, that we're colliding with uh, minus one. Uh, and when arriving at its place, uh, the pull-up behavior is, uh, is deactivated immediately. And the state of the bubble is set to locked. Um, Next, we need to determine the exact x-coordinate of the bubble, so it's nicely aligning with the other bubbles in the row. So we pick the marker uh, by using its row ID and we check the X coordinates of the bubble and the collision overlay to see if the bubble needs to snap to the left or to the right side of the bubble above it. So if the X coordinate um, of the bubble uh, is smaller or equal than the collision overlay of the other button, then we snap it to the left by changing the uh, X coordinate to the bubble size to the X minus bubble size divided by two. So it's uh, not directly under one another, else it's plus bubble size divided by two. Uh, so next we need to detect if a bubble needs to explode. Detecting is, in the, uh, is a process that involves checking coordinates, which can be hard if the bubbles are falling down. For that purpose, the timer is temporarily paused while the checking uh, for the explosions are, are executed. So we pause the timer, it's actually for milliseconds. Uh, the bubbles are to be exploded um, are added to a uh, temporary dictionary called explosions. So the first the dictionary needs to be cleared and next we detect which bubbles need to explode starting from the bubble that just arrived. This function will add bubbles to the explosions dictionary actually. Um, if there are three uh, or more bubbles to be exploded we need to check if there are bubbles uh, that are completely loose from one another as a consequence of the explosion. The explode loose bus button function is also uh, a function that will add bubbles that are loose to the explosions dictionary. Um, and finally, uh, all of the bubbles are exploded call by using the call uh, explode the, the function called explode, and the timer is resumed. Of course, um, when, a, when a bubble is destroyed, uh, we add. 10 to the score, it's just an arbitrary number. If the score is better, then we set the best score uh, to the score and we save it. And finally, the collision overlay connected to the bubble is also uh, you, uh, selected uh, using an instance variable called ref uid and it's destroyed alongside uh, with the bubble. 
that's it. Um, we have a helper function, get row ID from collision overlay to uh, easily identify uh, which uh, uh, row ID a collision overlay has because the overlay is attached uh, to the bubble and the bubble contains the row ID. So, uh, so the collision overlay is picked and the bubble is picked using its reference ID. Uh, and when the bubble is picked, the return value is set to the row ID of the bubble. Uh, otherwise, the return value will be zero. B. Uh, I don't know uh, collision. Uh, I don't know what it is. Dialog very simple. We have the dialog uh, interaction uh, group here, which just serves uh, as a group that's being activated and deactivated. Actually, when the uh, button try again is clicked, the, re the restart of the layout happens. And the function show game over dialog shows the dialog by setting the layer visible, setting a semaphore flag to one, and uh, activating the group so the button can be clicked. And the hide, hide game over dialog is just vice versa. Uh, we set the dialog to invisible, we, s we reset the, the semaphore, and we set the group to deactivate it again. So that way, uh, the, the button only applies uh, when the uh, group is activated. So now for the generation of the bubbles actually. There is uh, a function generate row and this function generates a whole new row of bubbles on a certain row ID with the past parameter. Uh, so the marker is picked by its row ID and then a for loop is done depending on the offset of the marker and if the offset equals zero that means that the row should start with a half a bubble and there is no need to spawn one extra um, if it start with uh, a full bubble that means that uh, it there would be a gap at the end of the row otherwise so we need to spawn one extra 13 instead of 12. Uh, so the bubble, bubble is spawned at the x coordinate uh, also depends on the offset and the index of the loop. So the state is automatically set to locked. That's it. That's what happens here actually. We do the offset plus the loop index minus one because we start from one times uh, the bubble size and a y coordinate of the marker. So what happens here inside the loop is we call another function called generate new bubble. And that's this function right here. We get x and y coordinates and a state as a parameter and uh, the matching row ID. So this function generates a new bubble at the x and y coordinate and the state is also set accordingly. What we do here is we use the weighted uh, attributes of uh, the advanced plugin, uh, advanced random plugin rather, uh, to set the bubble type. Um, and then we create that bubble type at the bubbles layer. We pick the last created one and we uh, disable uh, the bullet behavior so it doesn't get fired immediately. But we do set the bullet speed. Um, we set the state, the row ID and the bubble type, that's it. And then we automatically also create uh, an overlay uh, at the same X and Y coordinates. Um, we set the reference UID of the overlay and we just pin it uh, to uh, the, the bubble. Uh, that's it. And then make new marker. That's every time a new row spawns, uh, we create a new marker at the top left. Uh, that's being a new top marker. Um, the function creates a new marker at the spawning point. Uh, and uh, we do that here. And then we pick the last uh, created marker. We add uh, the row ID of the top marker needs to be one more than the current top marker. So we add one to the variable that keeps track of which marker is the top one. And next we set the offset of the new marker. It can be zero or a half of the bubble size actually, which is 32. We set the row ID to the top marker and the offset to the next offset. That's it, very simple. Um, and lastly, there's the most difficult part actually, and that's the explosions, the tracing of the explosion and the tracing of the loose bubbles. Um, if we collapse, uh, we have a trace uh, explode, a trace bubble, ex explode loose bubbles, detect explosions. Those are all uh, helper functions to help us uh, get through the uh, tracking process. 
So let's start with this one here, trace explode. So this is a recursive function. A recursive function is a function that calls itself. Um, the checks the, uh, the bubble that's being passed as a parameter is adjacent to a bubble of the same size, actually. Uh, the same type, excuse me. Uh, first, we pick the bubble that was passed and we retain its bubble type. That's it. So we put that in a, a local variable. Um, so this is a recursive function, and each iteration keeps track of the uh, keeps track of the bubbles it needs to check, and it's checked to do array, and it acts as a queue. So uh, all the bubbles are added to that queue, and uh, all of the bubbles are checked in order in that queue. Um, so that check to do array, which acts as a queue, is created at runtime, and it's set on the data layer, which was created especially for this purpose. So that, the only thing we do is we create an object, check to do, at 00, zero uh, of the data layer. Uh, and we initialize the return value to zero, meaning no adjacent bubbles would be found. Um, and in the check done dictionary, to avoid an endless loop. Because um, if we were not to do that, uh, for example, uh, uh, a bubble A would detect bubble B as an adjacent bubble. A bubble um, and bubble B would detect A as an adjacent bubble bubble, uh, bubble excuse me um, and so they would switch between one another so once bubble A is done we add it to the check done dictionary and we check if A is already in there then B does not do has does not have to uh, queue uh, A anymore because A has already been evaluated that's what happens actually um, so what we do is we pick here the uh, object, the check to do object, uh, and we save the array uh, UID uh, here to a temporary variable. And now we initialize the, the, um, the array, and we call a function called uh, queue adjacent bubbles. What it does is we give the UID of the current bubble and the array. And this function will fill the array, will fill the queue actually, with the six buttons that are adjacent to it. So the six buttons, maximum six buttons, because not all bubbles are uh, surrounded by six buttons, uh, bubbles of course. Um, so that's what happens. Uh, it will just queue them. And then we loop through all of the buttons in the, uh, all of the bubbles in the queue. So while the check to do is not empty, uh, we set, we pop the first bubble from the queue. Uh, we set it in cur current uh, UID, and we pop, uh, we pop it from the queue. So if there were six bubbles in the queue, now there are only five, and we retain that first bubble's UID inside cur UID. Uh, we pick the bubble with that instance cur UID, and compare it if the bubble type is the same as the bubble type that was passed along, that was saved here at the top. If so, we return 1, because this one has already found uh, a bubble type. We can stop the tracing um, for, this, uh, for this instance. So we found one, and we add the key to that explosion. And then what we do is we start the trace, trace explode function, which we're evaluating right now, again with that bubble. So for instance, for instance we are now evaluating bubble A, and that one is blue, and we found an adjacent bubble that's also blue. Then we set this value to the return value to 1, seeing I found a button, a bubble that's also blue, um, and then for that bubble blue, the B bubble with we, uh, which we found, we start the trace explode again. Um, that's what happens actually. And finally, uh, we destroy the queue after all this is done, after the entire while loop has done. So it has traced all of the explosions leading to the first explosion. Then the check to do array will be destroyed. And then we just return a 0 or a 1, depending if the 0 default value has been retained or it has somehow changed to 1 inside the loop. That's it. So that's pretty complicated. I realize that. Please check it out and, and try to understand it fully. Um,
so trace bubble uh, this actually does uh, the uh, exact opposite it's used actually in the explode loose bubbles function so this function the explode loose bubbles function it checks for the bubbles that are not in any way connected to an other attached to a bubble at the top of the screen so bu bubbles that are completely loose uh, so first we need to select all of the bubbles that are eligible for explosions uh, they can't be at the top of the screen they must be locked and because the bubbles being launched can't explode it can't it can't be a bubble that's already being added to the explosion dictionary actually so that's what happens here in this check for each of those bubbles which are uh, uh, which are eligible uh, we first clear the check done explosions because this uh, the recursiveness uh, is uh, way back <laughs> um, and we can't have an endless loop so we uh, also need the check done uh, dictionary and so then we will recursively trace the bubble to the top of the screen so if a bubble here is at the bottom, is, is at the bottom uh, of the entire bubble uh, stack, um, we need to check if somehow the bubble can be traced to the top of the screen. If it's not, if it cannot be checked, uh, traced to the top of the screen, it means somehow it's loose. It's loose by itself, or if it's attached to other button bubbles that are loose. That's exactly what it does. So for that, we use the trace bubble. Uh, function this one here and if it returns zero uh, that means uh, if it can't be done uh, meaning that the trace bubble returns zero the bubble is also added to the explosion dictionary um, but uh, and this is done for each of the bubbles that are loose actually and for each loop of all the of all the bubbles that are eligible uh, we check if it is loose by doing trace bubble but then if you check trace bubble by itself you will see that it's very similar to the trace explode but not exactly the same um, so this function checked if a bubble passed as a parameter it is attached to another bubble in that case it will also do the same function recursively for that bubble until no more bubbles can be found if the final bubble as not a bubble at the top of the screen that means that's not connected somehow to a bubble at the top of the screen that's basically what it does so here also each iteration is the process of tracing its own queue uh, this is an instance of the check to do array and it's created at runtime on the data layer which has been uh, created especially for that purpose so exactly the same as the trace explode we just return we set the return value to zero and we add uh, the UID which has been passed along to the done UID um, and then after picking the queue we set the array again here we clear the queue and then we call the exact same button as we called earlier to queue the adjacent bu bubbles and while that queue is not empty uh, we get the first item from the queue um, we pick that bubble and we check uh, if uh, the marker is the top marker of the screen if so, we return the value 1 and uh, we clear the array so it's not looping any further. Um, if not, we need to check the bubble we just popped from the queue uh, and trace if that bubble is connected to the top or not. So if uh, else, if not the top marker, uh, we set found to uh, the trace bubble again for this bubble ID where, which is being looped actually. Uh, so it's a recursive function once again. And um, in that, if it's one, in that case, we need to return one and clear the queue to stop the loop again. So that's what it does. It recursively runs until it found uh, until it finds one um, or not. And then finally, we uh, destroy the queue to avoid uh, some memory leaks and return one or zero. That's basically it. I understand that's not a, a very simple function to understand. Uh, so detect explosions uh, is a very simple helper function actually. Um, what it does, it calls actually trace explode, which I explained earlier. Uh, it does that by first uh, clearing the check uh, done uh, uh, dictionary. 
so we need to keep track of those bubbles uh, because there might potentially be an endless loop actually um, and we uh, pick the bubble passed as a, a parameter and then we just func uh, call the function trace explode and if it returns one that means the bubble uh, needs to be exploded and we fill the explosions uh, uh, the explosions dictionary actually uh, that's it so it doesn't do the effective explosion it just adds explosions to a dictionary uh, the explosions uh, actually happen here this is the explosions dictionary if it's not empty uh, the explosions will uh, be looped for each key and the bubbles will be picked uh, depending on the current key of the explosion so effectively here the, 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 the bubbles are destroyed and we create an object the particles at the bubbles layer um, and we set the zero parameter of the set color effect using a complex expression to set the color of the particles effect correctly you do that using the rgbx function which holds three parameters one for a red value for the uh, green value and the blue value uh, that's it and then there's two more helper functions uh, the q uh, adjacent bubbles and q adjacent bubble single uh, so the q adjacent bubble uh, is, a, is a function that takes a bubble uid as a parameter and it uh, and a type to check with the bubble uh, which bubble is next to it so there are six types br for bottom right bl for bottom left ur for upper right ul for upper left left and right that's it so what we do is we pick the bubble that we passed, uh, get passed along and we save its x and y coordinates. So if the type is br, we need to check if the bubble is overlapping x plus uh, bubble size divided by 2 and y plus bubble size because that's then the bottom, the bottom right bubble. Um, and we do the same thing for upper right, bottom left, etc. Um, that's it. So then we get a return value return value is a UID which defaults to 1 so it means if the get adjacent bubble returns 0 there is no adjacent bubble um, and there's a function a function Q adjacent bubbles which is plural of course and it just calls uh, the get adjacent bubble single uh, a function that I just explained and actually it does that six times once for UR once for UL etc um, and if it finds one it will push uh, the UID on the queue which, have been, which has been passed around as a, a parameter actually. So that's a bit tricky, the code. Please watch the video again or uh, get the template uh, to uh, uh, get a full grasp, uh, grasp of what's happening here. So as always, please like and subscribe. Um, and if you're interested, you, I will uh, paste uh, a link to the uh, Sira store in the description of the video. That's where you can get the full code of this template. Thank you.